Hi, welcome to Last Week in Local for the week ending September 3rd. It's a Tuesday, so I'm particularly confused. Um, <laughs> yeah, we'll blame it on Tuesday. We'll blame it on Tuesday. <laughs> Anyways, uh, welcome to Last Week in Local. Uh, before we get going, two announcements. One, I just want to let people know that the uh, we're get winding down. We have a few seats left for Local U Advanced in Denver. Uh, we have really good attendance, a lot of really great speakers, a lot of great attendees to learn from as well. Google's going to be there. Uh, as is David Mim, Thrive Hive, Call Rail. Uh, some of our sponsors are, you know, incredible as well. So, really, would encourage you to, to think about signing up. What's the date of the last discount on that? Uh, ends on the fifteenth, thirteenth. Sorry, the thirteenth okay. is the 13th last day for advanced, last pur advanced purchase. Yes. Advanced purchase on the thirteenth. So, we encourage you to do that. We also want to thank uh, Get Credo, uh, our sponsor. Get Credo is a marketplace for finding, hiring and working with the right digital marketing firm to take your business to the next level. Uh, they take a high-touch approach to helping you define your SEO and marketing project and then connect you with and hire the right firm for your business's unique needs. I want to just thank Credo. With that, we'll get kick, kicking off for last week in local. Um, great article at BuzzFeed News titled The Cost of Next Day Delivery, How Amazon Escapes the Blame for the Deadly Last Mile. Essentially, they, uh, what Amazon has started doing, rather than using subcontractors directly like Uber or Lyft, they incentivize their employees and other businesses to create Amazon-focused delivery, truck delivery services. They, they closely monitor the drivers through this, their routing software. They make entrepreneurs assume the financial risk in running the delivery business. They squeeze these businesses so these businesses end up, one, removing safety checks on the vehicle because the vehicles are a certain size. They're not required to be inspected by the federal, you know, they don't fall under federal inspection guidelines. <laughs> so there's accidents, people dying. You know, the drivers are driving. Sometimes they have to deliver up to 250 packages a day. A number of these companies have been sued by the uh, Department of Labor for not paying wages. I mean, it's a total shit show. And it just sort of points out how when labor laws are not enforced, sort of how far down the uh, rabbit hole, these, you know, Amazon included, go in terms of extracting profit and then isolating themselves for the responsibility. Oh. And there's a lot of money behind these companies to to lobby against being put under those labor law umbrellas too. They're going to pay a lot of money to not have to pay workmen's comp. And <laughs> yeah. Well, speaking of dystopian, uh, <laughs> there was an article in the Dallas News <clears throat> where a um, the Fort Worth based Buxton Live Mobile Insights <clears throat> shared. Information insights as to where people go when Chick Fil A is closed <laughs> on Sundays. Um, it, it, it's an interesting article because it, it it sort of shows what you get when you give locations permission to understand where you're going. They essentially bought the information about uh, people who gave them permission through various apps, and they analyzed it, and they were able to determine that Chick Chick Fil A's customers particularly visit. Whataburger on Sundays in Texas, but in the Midwestern states, they go to IHOP. So this is interesting, both in terms of the granularity of the information, but also in terms of it should scare us how much they know about us, <clears throat> our behaviors. For example, we typically go there on Saturday, but we don't go there on Sunday. That's a little scary. So I'm not sure uh, that that was the intended uh, purpose of the release of the public relations notice, but that's what I took <laughs> away from it. So pow powerful, but scary, and like Amazon, somewhat dystopian. Because um, Google has information like this as well. I mean, they Google do. has all the data. And they, that they do. <laughs> Uh, that they do. And they merge that with credit card data so they can actually get orthogonal proof that you went to IHOP instead of chick a for your breakfast that day. chick a fil chick a fil Excuse me. You're not missing uh, much. <laughs> okay. So, uh, Distilled.net had a great article on how to do change detection 
on the websites you manage with Screaming Frog and Google Sheets. If you work with more than one person in your organization, you're always testing and changing things on the website. And sometimes it's not easy to document that across multiple people. So they, they detail how you can set up Screaming Frog and Google Sheets to automatically track newly found pages and URLs, newly lost pages and URLs, indexation changes, you know, what things were no indexed or canicalized, status changes, uh, you know, that may move from a redirected to a 200 code, whatever. Title tag and medic description changes, H1 or H2 changes. I thought it was a really great article. And if you're running an agency of any size, it makes sense to formally do this about the website you're working with so you can have a, a good track record of the changes you made when you made them. Even as like an in-house, well, you're, maybe you have a webmaster or some, or some other department, I can totally see the value of this. I know personally I've – worked on a website or been working with a, with a company and they've got somebody internally who thinks they can re they they change h1 tags or they change title tags because they don't know what they're doing or right. you Good know point. change a url and they've completely blown something that we've been working on out of the water because they don't know what they're doing and and you don't find out about it until you like you're like oh this isn't working you have to dig in to find it so um I think that's it's really valuable. I'm going to dig deep into that one for sure. So I have my oh, – go ahead, Mary. Sorry. I was going to say I also think it's really valuable because sometimes you have really lazy webmasters mm -hmm. who um, they're using some program to update their site maps, and the program's never done a good job. So every time a change is made, things get messier and messier and messier. Mm -hmm. um, so this – just one way to make sure that things are being the, on the technical side being kept up to date also. For sure. So for my next topic, I should have included this back in my category of dystopian uh, articles. <laughs> I didn't. I should have put it a little earlier. Uh, good article from Tim Capper about the uh, unmerciful uh, expansion of l rehab lead gen spam in England. Obviously, it was a big issue in the United States, got covered very broadly. Google put in place a number of efforts to contain it. They seem to have contained it somewhat. Now it's popping up in England and probably in every other country in the world where there are uh, drug rehab issues. And, you know, definitely falls firmly in the area of dystopian. It's like I can't imagine a marketing program that targets with spam and who knows what types of services the least advantaged of us, those that are, you know, sick from vulnerable drugs. populations. I just, exactly. it, it disgusts me. It's horrifying. Yeah. Uh, interesting find at the Android police. Uh, most of you are familiar with the Google discover feed, the sort of information that Google delivers on the front page of the search results now to you. Um, that discover feed has started to show, at least in the examples they showed, uh, restaurant, re local restaurant recommendations. So it's interesting to think of, I mean, I know that they show for me local newspaper articles, but it would be interesting to see when and where they start showing local search results as part of that feed. Uh, maybe it's around dinner time. Maybe, <laughs> maybe the voice assistant heard me talking about dinner. Who knows? when and where they service it, but they've started surfacing local search results in the Discover feed. Something to keep an eye on. Um, Backlinko did a large-scale analysis of 5 million Google search results and what they learned about organic click-through rate. Uh, it didn't look at special results in organic, which have a huge impact, but in terms of the organic results, it returned what we basically knew. Nobody goes to page two. It's not even dead bodies. Even dead bodies aren't buried on page two, right? <laughs> um, most of the clicks go from one, one through three. There's a big drop off after that. And but some of the other tangential stuff was interesting. Um, the title tags that contained a question had a 14% higher click through rate versus pages that don't. Uh, title tags between 15 to 40 characters had the highest click through rate. Um, with 8.6% higher compared to those outside that range. Um, again, these are correlations, they're not causation, but they're, it's worthy of thinking about. I mean, the reason on the title tags is likely that the specific tag matches the query more closely, so you're gonna get higher 
user satisfaction from well, it. Well, and matching um, that query more closely within those first char visible characters, characters for right. a result, for sure. Exactly. Um, users, URLs that contain a keyword have a higher click-through rate, again, related to that shorter tags and use of the relevant words. Power words um, tend to lower the click-through rate. I can't remember what power words are these, but they did detail them in the article. And emotional titles seem to click, improve it somewhat. So I thought, it, we're taking a look. I don't think there's anything in here that isn't, that's earth-shattering. Well done study. Again, remember, it's correlations, not causations. So it isn't the gospel. There's no way to double-blind test this. Um, at uh, localvisibilitysystem.com, Phil Rozak did a good article titled 10 Better Ways to Do Keyword Research for Local SEO, where he talks about ways to use your and your competitors' reviews to determine what users are writing about, and as Carrie pointed out in the pre-talk, what the sentiments they're expressing around those things, which ones they really like, which ones they don't like. Uh, as a side note on that, uh, GatherUp has recently introduced into beta a tool that sort of does this using IBM Watson's natural language processing to analyze all the words in your reviews. So uh, obviously I'm a principal in GatherUp, but it, it relates to Phil's topic and might automate some of this task for people. Does it present it in a really pretty word cloud, Mike? That would be neat. Yes. In That's fact, it's more than, more than just a word cloud. It's a word cloud that analyzes both volume of the word, mm -hmm. how it relates to the reviews as well. Because you may have a 4.5 average, but you may have some negative words in those 4.5 average reviews. So it highlights those as negative. It shows the size and frequency of them as well. So it's, it's a word cloud on steroids, actually, because mm -hmm. it gives you multiple data points. So I'd be glad to show it to you at some point. Anybody wants a demo, feel free to email me. Uh, <laughs> obviously, this is an unpaid sponsorship. I, uh, <laughs> um, it's a pretty cool feature. Um, beyond conventional SEO, this is from Brody Clark at Search Engine Land, unraveling the mystery of the organic product car carousel. Google, I know it was about six months ago, started beta testing the ability to upload your product feeds directly to the Google Merchant Center for free. You don't need to be running AdWords to do it. And they show up on product searches with also, they'll show up in var variations of product searches, uh, as well as potentially showing up in your knowledge graph. And so he goes in great detail about how to implement this. And I thought it was a very useful and local for those of you that have product feeds that you can feed into this system. And then finally, uh, another article from Tim Capper at onlineownership.com, the ranking effect of changing a local GMB listing to SAB from showing the address. A lot of people are afraid to do it uh, because sometimes you see a drop in rank when you do it. He points out, at least from his research, that if, you, if the local business page has been around for at least a year, if there are citations in existence that include the location of the business at Yelp and wherever else, and if you have addresses and location information on your website and structured data, his experience is that hiding it has no impact, which two things. One is means you can do it to be in compliance, and two, it means that that information is still being used by Google even though Theoretically, it's a service area business. So it behooves you to show that information if you can. And with that, over to you. All right. Thanks, Mike. Um, at Search Engine Land, Greg Sterling did an article based on some research at Wampley um, that talks about how re there are other things that are more important than your star ratings when it comes to reviews. Um, that 3.5 to 4.5 stars um, is probably better than 5.0 stars. That businesses with just a more, note on that research on that. You know, I did some research a couple of years ago that showed that there was a demographic skew as to age preference on which stars you would select. So if you're over 50, it was typically if you had a demographic over 50, they would choose businesses with. 4.5 and up, over 40 was like 4.0 and up, and over 30 was 3.5 and up, and between 25 and 30 was like 3 and up, was adequate <laughs> to choose a business, which I thought was fascinating that it's like 
all these young guys have any taste? What's the problem here? But anyways, <laughs> or relates- do they realize that how many, how much review spam is going on, so they don't put that much stuff? Well, it, you know, in most industries and in most markets, I mean, we see review spam because we're looking at the underside of the beast all day long. But if you do, if typical searchers don't see it that much. Clearly, it's, it's a very localized phenomenon in very localized industries. You know, and I would never search Google for a locksmith, a garage door opener, a roofer, or even a lawyer, you know, not to <laughs> lump them all together into the same sort of lump, but I will. Um, you know, there's tendencies in those industries to spam and it's worse. You know, again, it depends a lot on the business and the market, but I wouldn't ask for a lawyer advice from Google regardless, right? So, yeah, really. <laughs> So um, they Sorry. also talk about if you have claim listings on multiple sites, you you earn more revenue. If you respond to um, reviews, you get you make more revenue. So it's mostly, I think, just a study showing that the more effort you put into your reviews mm-hmm. in all the ways, um, the more you're going to get back out of it. Right, and and also the realization that a rating score less than five is not just more okay. believable, <laughs> it's more likely to convert, right? Yes. That, that you're more likely to convince consumers to do business with you if they don't see a perfect five-star rating, which causes a problem for somebody like Barbara, because she truly, Barbara Oliver, because she truly is a five-star company. But where the way she deals with that is this question of, reputation story across multiple locations that tell a consistent same same story so anyways okay and then um white spark danny owens at white spark wrote a really nice uh beginner's guide to technical seo for local businesses she takes you all the way through keyword research to how to optimize your website and uh it's a really good guide that anybody who's working in local um optimizing local business you should take a look at you know sometimes we forget basic things that we learned long ago when we we discontinue their use or stop paying attention to them or think you can do it once and forget about it and this is a good guide to uh, remind you of all the little things you can do to optimize a local business website and then lastly i was messing around looking for something on google and i got a invitation from Google to uh, join their research, uh, user experience research. Um, And um, we've got a link here that will take you to where you can sign up for that. And uh, they have research on, on a lot of different topics. And I have gotten, I signed up for it and I get Um, You know, I thought I was signing up for feedback on one thing and I'm getting asked for feedback on other things. So it's probably worthwhile to sign up for this just so you can find out what the heck Google is asking for feedback about, because those are things that they probably think are important. Now over to you, Carrie. Thanks. Uh, Jamie Pittman over at Bright Local put together uh, an interesting resource about conducting a local SEO audit. I think it's a a good overview of kind of the basic things to look at when reviewing opportunities for a local website. Um, Certainly not, you know, hugely in-depth. I'd call this maybe the five to 10,000 foot view of local search, but definitely things to have in your back pocket. So um, I enjoyed that article. Mike wrote a really cool article over at Gather Up um, about telling your brand story across search with Google My Business. Um, and it was, uh, he, I thought it was interesting. He wrote it in response to a question posed by another publication and they rejected his answer, declined to use his answer, I think because of link, Mike. I'm not sure why, which I think is just crazy. Like, <laughs> if you want to know something about local and Mike gives you a like article length answer and you say, no, we don't want that. <laughs> I just oh, decided it's like they, all day long. <laughs> right, they, they wanted like a, a pad answer to a complicated question. And I just said, I'm not going to give you a pad answer to a complicated <laughs> question here. Take this or don't take it. I'm fine either way, but they didn't take it. So 
I got so, a good blog post on it. Right. So benefit to gather up because I think it's a really great article that talks about um, almost storyboarding your brain and how you want your brain to be perceived and what you can do to help that happen. Um, you know, looking at review sentiment and and not only what you write about your brand, but what other people's write about your brand and how you can help you know, influence that. So I think it's a great article. I really enjoyed it. And the role of things as big as images across multiple sites mm -hmm. and as little as favicons across your site. Right, for sure. Um, and then Brandon Schmidt from YDOP um, wrote us an article for the local U blog about um, six different ways to use frequently, to answer frequently asked questions online, which I thought was a great piece about, uh, almost about repurposing your FAQ content in multiple ways and multiple places to share it from putting it on your own website and marking it up to using it as Google Q and a fodder. You know, we always encourage people to ask and answer their own questions. Um, I think that's even more important now that those questions and answers are being pulled into that suggested answer, um, feature that they have, um, so I, I really recommend people take a look at this article. I think FAQ content is super powerful right about now. Um, whether it continues to be, who knows? Um, but I think if you can put FAQ content related to your products and services on your products and services page, mark it up, it ranks well, it happens fairly quickly, um, and it's you know a, a low time investment for a pretty decent outcome. So um, I really enjoyed that article from Brandon for sure. Um, Brittany Muller did a whiteboard Friday over at Moz about refurbishing your top content. Um, and uh, I think that I've been thinking about this for a while now, and, um, we are getting back into that blog post, blog post, blog post mentality. Um, we meaning the uh, marketing as a whole. Um, I think volume again is, is becoming the focus and I think it's bad. I think we need to start looking at the things that are outdated on our websites and trying to figure out, should we prune it? Should we update it? Should it become, you know, content on a page instead of a blog post? I think we need to really do some serious pruning of our blogs um, outdated stuff should be updated or gotten rid of. I don't think it does us any good to rank for things that are outdated. I, I mean, it just kind of, you, you can look at the date and see that it's outdated, but you know, what good do we do by ranking for outdated content? I don't now, know. I, I want to point out, I went back and read a series I did on ranking in local in 2006. Sure. And what's amazing yeah. about it is how relevant it is still today. So sometimes, you know. Sometimes it is, and sometimes it's evergreen, and sometimes it's historical. And I think it doesn't it doesn't rank because it never got any links. It was one of my first blog post articles series, right. so I got maybe one link ever, but still. So if you want a link to it, go look it up. It's a good article. Anyway, I think that there's there's some purpose to showing history or showing you know this is where we've come from. I think there's purpose to that, but. Having 10 posts on your blog about why you should pick an air conditioner over a swamp cooler is unnecessary. I think that, you know, having one really great page on your website about why is better than, you know, 10 half-assed things, to be perfectly honest. And so yeah. I think yeah. that we need to think, do better about thinking about how to, how to prune and refurbish our content. And this is a good Whiteboard Friday that supports that idea for sure. Um, and then also at the Moz blog, Miriam Ellis wrote a post about using kindness as currency in local business. And I love the idea of um, your employees being your brand advocates as well and, and being empowered to put your best foot forward with the public and the, and the opportunities that can arise from that. Um, I just watched a video on Facebook. I was telling you guys in the pre-talk about um, some cashiers in line at Trader Joe's singing and dancing because one of their customers' kids was having a meltdown while she was trying to check out and get out to her car to her groceries just to entertain the kid. And somebody shot a video of it, shared it online, and they made the news. And they got all kinds of um, attention and press and information from this one organic thing. And I think it starts with the business empowering the employees. Um, Mary, you were talking in the pre-talk about how important that is, how 
to, to have happy employees and, and them know that the customer is their greatest commodity and they treat them like gold every single time. Um, I think that, that that as currency is a great idea. I do think it has to be organic. I think if it was the marketing person standing there videoing this artificial scenario that they set up, it would not be nearly as powerful as just the lady behind her in line posting it kind of thing. Um, but um, I I like that the thought and the idea behind it for sure, and I think it's a good a good article for you to use to convince the C suite that you would need to empower your employees to do good. Um, if you've got to convince the C suite that that's the case, yeah. you're already fucked. You well, are already sort fucked. of. I I agree with that. I mean, I think Mary and I can attest to that from past experience for sure. Right. Um, I mean, I mean, that sort of sentiment that everybody is capable of taking great care of the customer and everybody should learn the product and the processes and the, you know, and that they should be free to make reasonable decisions in the context in which they're presented. That's a central company value or not. Mm -hmm. And if it is, then you can reinforce it. You know, for example, when, when our employees that gather up are called out in a review for having created an exceptional experience. We call that out every week and note to those people and share it with everybody. You know, we that's what we want, right? And we've tried to, as Mary, somebody pointed out, you know, you got to hire good people, but you got to also have the philosophy that those people are competent, capable, caring people and should be allowed to do what they do, you know? Absolutely. And, and I would say, my comment about the C-suite was more from a, when they start getting to quantity over quality, because they have those conversations of we need more production, we need you to work faster, we need this, we need that. That's ammunition to go back to them and say, okay, I can do this, but here's what we're going to lose if we do this kind of thing. So there's, it's just something to have in your back pocket is that, that piece, I think. Um, I doubt it. that Amazon cares whether their independent contractor drivers runs over some little old lady. Well, they feel yeah. they well. don't give a shit. And that, that's true. <laughs> but, you know, I was reading a, an article about Disney World and how they refer to their customers as guests mm-hmm. and how that has a positive impact on uh, everyone's interaction with staff when the staff is thinking of those people as they're that they are hosts and those people are their guests and they are there to take care of them uh in any way that they can Mm -hmm, for sure and they refer to their employees as cast members um which i think engenders this that feeling of being part of something um i think that's yes it's an interesting outlook on how you how you how the way you treat your employees trickles down to the way your employees treat your customer Exactly. Um, and then the last thing I have is Mike posted a short blog post over on his Blumenthal's blog about um, Google testing new calls to action and related searches in local. Um, you have to go look at the GIF he posted with the article to really understand what I'm talking about. But they've made this view more button bigger and they've added these um, kind of accordion like drop downs based on related searches or categories below it. Um, it's very interesting view. I can't recreate it. Mike gets it in a few different ways. I think he must have like, you know, super secret access to a super secret uh, server I, he never asked for. Does Mike want to show it know. to us? <laughs> I don't I don't I don't think there's an easy way to show it effectively, but I um I don't think it's easy. I can do a screen share, but the screen shares when there's three people don't even work. So, yeah. but basically, for whatever reason, my phone on one account or another seems to be tapped into some test server. Cause I've been seeing a lot of tests lately, um, so which is fun. Anyway, but, follow the link and look at the GIF that he posted because he scrolls through and it shows the drop downs and the view more buttons and stuff. It's very interesting. I, I don't know how I feel about it as, I mean, there's opportunity there. I guess if you could show up for multiple related searches, there's a lot of opportunity there, but there's also a lot of competition there. So instead of it being three or four results, it's a lot more results <laughs> in that one query for that one query. Right. So, and I don't know. further pushes organic down the page. Which is a good or a bad thing. And and in local search, maybe that's a good thing because a lot of what the organic is is like 
you know, say for a HBAC query, it's Thumbtack and Angie's List. And I, I don't know I many know. consumers or that get Yelp a lot the, out of that. Oh, or Yelp, the 10 best, and then you go to Yelp, and it's 10 ads, and then the 10 best. Right. Right. So yeah. I'm fine with them pushing that garbage down the page, to be honest. <laughs> and that's what I have. I'm, that's it for me. I'm All right. <laughs> well, with that, we'll be wrapping up. I want to thank you for joining us. Just a reminder, September 19th, Denver. If you're a listener uh, and you're in Denver, be sure to reach out to each of us and let us know the good, the bad, and the ugly of listening to us. Um, <laughs> we appreciate it, your feedback. And I also want to thank um, getcredo.com. They, uh, they, they specialize in hiring the right marketing firm, which is often a daunting task. They exist to help you find and hire the right SEO, PPC, or digital marketing firm for your unique needs. It's founded by John Doherty, a digital industry veteran who's firmly established in the space. And Credo, he notes that Credo is the best way to find and hire a digital marketing firm in days not months, and they'll walk you through the process. So check them out, getcredo.com. With that, I want to say thank you for joining us for Last Week in Local, and we'll see you next week. Thanks, everybody.